<sighs> okay, I just I just pick up myself some Taco Bell. I am I am starving. This is my first time trying Taco Bell here, but 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 on with the show. So hello everybody and welcome to another Godzilla film podcast episode. And the last episode I did was Godzilla vs. the Destroyer. And that was my final episode for the Heisei era. And I I have that I've done in, in a two weeks ago. And and today, be, before I get to the millennium era of Godzilla films, I want I want to talk about the first American film of Godzilla that was made in ni- 1998, Godzilla, which is my very first Godzilla film I ever watched before I discovered the Toho Godzilla films, and. We have a very special guest here tonight, and he goes uh, G Fez uh, uh, all the time in a few years, and and he has his own YouTube channel. And please welcome Nick Herbert from Minus Media. Greetings, everybody. How's it going? Hope yeah, I'm, a good night. I'm doing good, Nick. I, I'm. I'm glad to have you on my show here, and I'm looking forward to do this with you. And we and I we have met a few times at G Fest, and and in fact, we just met in person this year at the All Monsters Attack events. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, thank you for having me on your show. By the way, I wanted to thank you for that. And yeah, my, All Monsters Attack was a blast. By the way, if anybody uh, who hasn't gone to All Monsters Attack yet, I uh, highly recommend you go to the next one when that one comes around. Uh, yeah, it was great finally getting to meet you in person, my friend. And yeah, let's let's do this. Yeah, and and I and I can't wait to see you again at G Fest this year. It, actually, it's G Fest is next month. Actually, yeah, yeah, it's coming by really fast. Uh, I'm trying to get so much done before uh, G Fest rolls around. I'm um, trying to rebuild Zigra right now as we speak. <laughs> the uh, costume I had at the previous conventions, it was based off of uh, Gamera, Gamera's rival from uh, Gamera vs. Zigra, and uh, later had him used in uh, the little G-Fest uh, film that was shot there called uh, Godzilla Battle Royale. Yeah, and, and and yeah, and here's a picture of us uh, from G-Fest last year, and it and it was a blast that that we finally got to meet our online friends for the first time in person, and that I met you and Nick Lamore as yeah, you know, Go Goji fan nine, 1998, and mm-hmm. and all our other friends Kaiju Kim and the others, and and that we all know of, and so yeah, and I've been looking forward to see you again at G Fest this year, and yeah, and. So I'm looking forward to talk about the first American Godzilla film from 1998, which is uh, my very first Godzilla film, and and this film was also your first film too, right? Uh, no. So my first film was uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters, and then I saw this one sometime after Godzilla 2000 came out. Uh, my brothers had a VHS copy of the original film and they uh, had an extra copy of Godzilla 98. And one day I just got, you know, kind of bored. I saw the eyeball of Godzilla on it and then I watched <laughs> it and I really enjoyed it, you know, s- despite the fact that I saw the first Godzilla first in 2000. So it's technically the third Godzilla movie I saw. Ah, it is very interesting. Yeah, so yeah, I, and I would like to talk about the story I, that about this film, how I discovered it. And mm. this was my very first Godzilla film before I discovered Godzilla 1985, which is my first Toho Godzilla film. Uh, that I def- I first discovered this film that was that my dad used to have this on VS Chess, and. And I never watched it that much. I mean, I wasn't into Godzilla that much. I don't even don't know what Godzilla is at the time. And 
when I first watched this, and uh, Godzilla uh, kind of makes me think he looks like a giant dinosaur, dragon dinosaur with just some shark fins on it. Uh, and and this film is what makes me become more a little interested of Godzilla, which is today, and what made me a Godzilla fan. I mean, it, it, I mean, right after this film, it, that Godzilla 1985 and the other Toho films I discover in the video games, they those are the ones who make me become a Godzilla fan and make me more interested of that kaiju. I mean, and I gotta thank my father for for having this film on VS Chess back then when I was a kid. I mean. If he hasn't uh, bought this film on VS Chess, I would never even know who Godzilla is or discover it. Yeah, that's it's really interesting how you got into uh, the this movie uh, from your dad having a copy and then um, seeing that this one first before all the. Uh, other Toho movies. So here's a really good question for you to start again. So knowing that you saw the 98 film first and then seeing the Toho Godzilla afterwards, do, do you think when you got, when, you know, we got onto the internet and stuff and, there, and you find out for the first time that there was some sort of backlash with the movie, you know, did you ever think that maybe their points were right? Like it kind of challenged, like you thinking like this might not be, Godzilla, you know, because well, I'm sure we all had that moment at one point where we thought like, well, maybe the design's a little too off from Godzilla or maybe it's just we don't understand the design enough. So that was I thought it was a good starting point to ask you, like, what what did you think when you started realizing the community was kind of eh, about uh, the 98 Godzilla film? Hmm, that's a really good question, Nick. I mean. When I first know about this film, I mean, when I first said, like, how do I know if this is, is Godzilla? I mean, I mean, right after I saw this film a couple of times, a few years, I mean, I know uh, uh, when I went to my other via local video store, they used to exist. And when I look around some VHS chess movies to, to see if there are any dinosaur movies, but of course I saw the the cover of the 1998 Godzilla film, but right next to it is the Godzilla 1985 film with Raymond Burr. When I saw this cover, I thought, is that Godzilla? He looks nothing like the uh, the one I usually watch. But but that but that that's the real Toho Godzilla creature, yet not the TriStar. Yeah, it's it is like the first time I'm sure like that first time you saw it, it must have been very uh, a little shocking because, you know, you're like, wait, wait a minute. Like, that's Godzilla. Like, where's <laughs> where's the chin? Where's the chin? <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 can, I can imagine how how that was. Um, you know, it was it was kind of weird, like for on my end, uh, on my, my part of the story, like how like yours seeing it like that. I, I just kind of assumed it was another version of Godzilla. That's the way I took it because there's, I understood that they were trying to make it more realistic and they did change his origin to be that he's not a dinosaur. He's a mutated green iguana out in the Polynesian islands. And from knowing that I just kind of accepted, okay, this is a different version of the character that's very different, but I can still accept it because I do see a lot of characteristics from from a little bit of the Toho movies in there with the character, and we'll, we'll go into that later on, and I'll I'll give yeah. you what I, what I mean by like what specific characteristics does the ninety eight Godzilla yeah. share with the Toho one a little bit? Yeah, and I actually got the figure right here. It, yeah, and I just wish that they could have made the Bandai version of him. It, well, who knows? And maybe Bandai will make a figure version of, of him. 
So funny you ask, funny you ask that. So Bandai did make a gash like a um, semi large Gashapon figure. It's like a four inch Godzilla ninety eight figure they made, and the sculpt is very similar to how the Trend Masters are sort of done because he stands upright like your figure does, and the coloring is like a dark blue with a um, little bit of like uh, green going down the spines, I believe. And then the eyes were yellow and you could move his arms like this, like his arms were in like this pose. Um, I know a couple collectors have him. Uh, they made that one and then they made like the little really tiny candy capsule toys. <laughs> and then Marmot and X plus did some back in the day. And then that was kind of it. Now we have the YMSF uh, Godzilla 98 figure coming out pretty soon. And I heard they're having a G fest exclusive, which is a Godzilla junior from the animated series. Wow. I, I did not know that. They, uh, they shared a couple images on their Instagram page, just, uh, to you and the audience, you go on Instagram and Google YMSF and you can pull up the posts about it. Hmm. Maybe someday I'll check it out. And, and yeah, like, so, and I want to you know, talk about back to how I discovered the film and then how I, how this film is different than the one I first discovered my first Toho Godzilla film, I mean, the 1985 one. I, I thought that was like a, like a sequel to the 98 Godzilla, but I was wrong. That was back that time. I don't know. I really don't know much about Godzilla. Hmm. Yeah, until I know more today, right now. Yeah, that's that's um, you know, I was wondering. So when you fe- when you finally did figure out that it wasn't a sequel, what would you think about that? Uh, well, I figured out uh, when I well when I first went to the nineteen eighty five God uh, Godzilla on VS Chess. I mean, uh, it was. I mean, when I watched it, it, it was so old that that I realized it, this is not a sequel. It's just, it just looks like an original Godzilla film. Mm. Yeah, and so yeah, and and the the design of this creature it was actually created the the creator design of this Godzilla was created by called Pat Patrick Otopoulos. That's his name. And and you heard me that his last name is the Topolis. Yeah, that, it's the Topolis. <laughs> I had a quote. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and they actually use that, and they actually use that same last name in the film for Math, Matthew Broderick's character, Nick Topolis, <laughs> yeah. the, the Lion King himself. Simba, Simba is in the Godzilla movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it is so weird. Like in a few years later, when I was watching The Lion King, I I thought I recognized that voice. That's actually Nicotopolis, and I and I learned that M- Matthew Roche's uh, Simba character was the same guy who was in Godzilla. Yeah, I when I was a kid, I didn't pick it up at first and then i think it was sometime when i was getting ready to head into middle school it finally just hit me i was like wait a minute you know <laughs> like this because they're because they you know matthew broderick acts like matthew broderick you know like in most of his movies so when you hear the <laughs> voice you're like wait wait a minute you know like it was um there's another movie I think he also voice acted and it was called like the thief and the cobbler, I think. And then that's, <laughs> that's another one I knew him from. So I was like, Oh, it's, it's you. It's the worm guy from Godzilla 98. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I gotta say that, 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 that's that this film that it was released in the same year that the live action inspector gadget film was released. I think it, that Matthew Broderick was in that one too. Yeah, he he was. I believe Inspector Gadget was 1999. I think. I don't think it was 98. I, I think I'm a little confused like on that. I think I think yeah. that film was released a year after. And yeah, and yeah. I mean, so yeah, he he was like 
Yeah, his character Nicotopolis, he's all like I love the the beginning. It was that he was in this van uh, uh, driving. He was sing, he was just listening to the radio, singing in the rain. I'm yeah. singing in the rain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is like the second time they use like a singing in the rain references in a Godzilla film because they used because in the English dub audio for Godzilla versus the Destroyer, and that. And when the the security guard was walking in the aquarium and he was humming, singing in the rain in the English dub audio, it, but but in in this one it, they they actually have uh, Nick Topless just singing along in in the for the in the radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and ironically, both films involve a lot of fish. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. <laughs> and we do have some guesses on in the comments. We have Go, Gojira851. How are you doing? How's and we have Kaiju Brother, GojiFan98. How's it going? And it says, hello, you, th there are you guys. And, and did you guys mention about the original idea for TriStar Godzilla for should direct it by... John D. Bond to have Godzilla battle with with the gr Griffin. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, uh, I don't think we did mention that. I think, but I think we'll get to that any moment. And and we have Walter here. How's it going, my man? Hey, Walter, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> it's, and yeah, this was next. Gochi fan at 98's birth film. Uh, and yeah, and and also along with the Mighty Kong and, and Rebirth of Martha 3. Yeah, that's, that's another movie I totally forgot about. It came out the same year as the 98 Godzilla film. You, know, you have Rebirth of Martha 3 that came out in Japan alongside uh, Godzilla 98. Yeah, and yeah, I should I should do an episode uh, of the Mighty Kong and Rebirth of Mothra trilogy. But who knows? Maybe I'll do those right after I get through the Millennium Era of Godzilla's. And anyway, like, so, so let's get, so let's talk about what Nick talked about, about the original idea for the Tristar Godzilla. And uh, so, so, I have been doing a lot of research of that yeah, the original idea for the Tristar Godzilla that was that was actually back in 1993 or 92. Hey Zilla, cut it out. Yeah. And, but anyway, like it was actually you know, during back in 1992 or 93, I don't know, but that that the original like there's some the original people who want to make a, their own American version film of Godzilla is it's called Terry Rosio and Ted Elliott who wanted to make uh, their own American Godzilla film uh, but sadly it never happened that I think as I think it due to budget issues or I'm not really sure but but this is not the only idea, but there, there's also other ideas that are back in the 80s that in the 80s, there were some other people who want to make their own American Godzilla film. I mean, they want to make a movie called Godzilla 3D. And, and that idea, they, they, have, they have a model design of Godzilla that kind of actually looks like a dinosaur of a T-Rex looking with spines. But sadly, uh, you know, those, yeah, you know, but it, it never got happened. And there was also another Godzilla designed uh, in the, in the nineties after Terry Rosso and Ted Elia's ideas were scrapped and canceled. And that there was a design of it that was, yeah, created by Stan Winston's people, that who are the the, the same guy who designed the dinosaurs for Jurassic Park. Remember that, Nick? 
Yeah, Sam Winston's guys made a couple maquettes of their Godzilla design, and then they did the Griffin as well. And I forget what the bat demon things were called. Um, there, the Griffin was supposed to have like these little bat minions that have like these little wings and tails and these like two claws, two hand claws on the front along with fangs, and they have some sort of symbiosis with the Griffin monster. And I think in that version of the script that um, Godzilla was supposed to be made by Atlantis <laughs> to protect mankind <laughs> from Griffin. And uh, I, yeah, the early 98 Godzilla design or Godzilla ideas, I should say, were interesting. I just, none of the story ideas really capture me. I'm going to be honest with you. Like yeah. just the idea of Godzilla being made by Atlantis is like, what <laughs> like yeah. I, I i i couldn't get on with i couldn't get on with that if that was cannot if that canonically happened and that's like the final movie we would have gotten i don't think i would have been with it i would have enjoyed the the fight with him and griffin and stuff and maybe some of the effects it would have done along yeah. with the godzilla design but i would have been kind of disappointed with the story to be honest yeah that'd yeah. be so weird godzilla find the called the griffins <laughs> yeah griffins <laughs> hey Godzilla, see what I did to New York? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, but no, we're not talking about the Family Guy Griffins. They're talking about the mutate Griffins. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, and now that we've been talked about this, I, I'm thinking about doing a, a a topic episode about it someday in the future. And yeah, I got to learn more about uh, the. Ted and Terry's cre creation. It, but anyway, like, so yeah, let's talk about the original directors and creators for this film. Uh, Roland Emmerich and D. Devlin. Isn't mm -hmm. it? I hope I said their name right. No, you said their name right. It's Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin. Yeah, and he, and they're the same creators who created, who create and directed Independence Day, which. It's a film that I never seen before. You've never seen Independence Day? No. Oh, man, if you are you, you're missing out. Okay, like July. Well, if you're not doing anything July 4th, like go watch it. Like it's it's a fun movie. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm assuming you are gonna be doing some July 4th, you know, fireworks and everybody gets together. But yeah, sometime go watch that movie. Maybe before July 4th. It's a it's a fun movie. It's it's a blast. Like I always enjoy it. Yeah, and yeah, I should give it a watch someday, and and yeah, and and of course, they Independence Day, they they use some of the stock footage uh, they added in Austin Powers film and in the second film. Well, actually, that was just footage from the movie Independence Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know the scene where the the aliens destroy the the White House. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should give that film a watch someday, and yeah, I mean, so what I hear they that Roland Emmerich and D. Devlin they they did visit Toho. They they did have a little conversation with them. They talk about they want made, to make their own Godzilla film, and what I hear there they have a they have a very long you know, conversation and uh, a long meeting to. To, uh, to discuss uh, were they making this film or not, but Toho actually accepted accepted them. They, they go ahead and make their own, and and they actually hand out the the rights license uh, to to them, and they give them a few rules about about making this that uh, that Godzilla should create by nuclear tests. And they they wanted, so they actually did. They, so yeah, so Roland Emmerich and D. Devlin just they just you know had this long conversation with Toho, and they actually and they actually started writing this the script, the story of it. They actually wrote this while they're down in Mexico after the their flyback from Japan. Yeah, yeah, they started writing it when they were down in uh, Mexico, like you said. And uh, what's interesting is there's been talk a lot of time about the specific book that um, was either 
They either did have from Toho. It was a rule book about what they could and could not do with Godzilla. I don't know if they actually ever got the book. Some said they did have it, and they kind of looked at it a little bit, and was like, yeah, about the rest of it. And then there's, uh, I remember there's a post Patrick Atopoulos made a long time ago. I think it was like three years ago, where he said, oh, well, I never got the book, so I never even, like, knew mm. Like he said, like, like I knew about it, like way too late. Uh, that was, that was a story that I've heard. Although um, what's interesting is that there's a, a rule that's brought up a lot says that Godzilla couldn't die and they broke that rule. That's not, yeah. the, that, that's not the case though. It's that Godzilla can't permanently die. And you'll notice this in the later movies, like the anime trilogy, there's, Godzilla gets killed off in the first one and another one just pops up at the end of the first anime trilogy movie. In fact, he actually gets killed by futuristic drill missiles, which is kind of a, a similar nod to Godzilla 98 when I think about it, just because there are these little impulse <laughs> missiles that go into his body and they yeah. blow up. Um, but but yeah, like that's that's a the problem, the problem with the rule of that Godzilla can't die is that Toho has already broken that rule before. Like after the movie was already, you know, after the 98 film had been out and everything. And then, you know, the Amy Trilly comes out. They did that. They also made Godzilla asexually reproduce in Shin Godzilla. It's not quite the same like the 98 Godzilla, but he still does it regardless. It's just through cell mitosis. So every mm. chunk of his body gets blown off by the military grows into another Godzilla. But it's. It's the same end result, though. It's Godzilla repopulating the world through asexual reproduction in both movies. Just the way that they do it in the 98 film is a lot different, of course. And then, you know, Shin Godzilla being different. Uh, but, yeah, the rule was is that Godzilla couldn't permanently die. And they, they just left it where, okay, we're going to have this last Godzilla egg be the real Godzilla that becomes the main character for the sequel and then what would have been the last film because the, the 98 film or 98 film series I should have said it was supposed yeah. to be a trilogy, was supposed to be a trilogy you know that's right to be a trilogy of movies so their idea on the writing board was we're gonna have this Godzilla shows up die and then the one that comes in the next movie is going to be the one that is the main Godzilla for all the rest of the films uh we got we gotta get into the topic about how they killed him in the 98 film because there's something i've looked at multiple times going back to the first godzilla movie and i've come to the conclusion why they might have killed him the way they did at, le at least i'm i'm pretty convinced because uh, i don't want to get into it yet but i want to hear what your response is first to the earlier conversation we had before we get into <laughs> that whole thing on the bridge but go on <laughs> yeah and yeah and i gotta say they 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 were gonna make a trilogy but sadly it just never did happen because uh, i think it's due to budget issues and and i think i don't know if this is true but in one of the trilogies films i mean they were gonna ha added martha in one of the sequel films yeah but I'm not sure. But but I think uh, uh, Gochi fan ninety ninety eight would know. Okay. So a sequel was written uh, by Tab Murphy, and what was supposed to happen was that the little baby Godzilla we saw at the end of the ninety eight film would have escaped, and he would have grown up and been around Australia with uh, two other younger Godzillas. I guess he asexually reproduced and had as his children. And then there would have been a big insect moth monster. Oh, it's like a big insect moth. <laughs> big insect monster that would have been very close to Megagirus, except like a giant, angry murder hornet wasp that could control a swarm that was going to be called the queen, you know, like queen, <laughs> oh, yeah. queen B. I can't, I don't want to say it, yeah, but just, yeah, I, I, I asked. What uh, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if people uh, 
if they did shout out the 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 mutated dragonfly's monster's name that will shout out language <laughs> right i actually <laughs> asked uh i asked tab murphy i said uh is there an official since this is your monster you made up is there like an official name we can call it aside from the queen you know and he said sure we're gonna call it i'll call it stinger let's call it stinger i was like okay so the yeah. monster's new official name is stinger it's not queen <laughs> like it wasn't the script <laughs> so it's it's stinger uh yeah so stinger would have uh had a whole hive that it could control and it would have been a big giant like very mean looking murder hornet that was red and black with like big fangs on its teeth big angry bug eyes like Megan Garris, you know, the, the reason I keep referencing Megan Garris is because when I interviewed tab, he literally said the monster would have been like what Megan Garris kind of looks like, except more like a wasp than a dragonfly. So, yeah. And it, <laughs> Yeah. In fact, yeah. We, we, we made a joke about how possibly Toho got inspired by the script, and that's where Megagiris came from, is actually because they looked at the 98 sequel script. They're like, oh, oh why don't we use that? And then, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. where uh, Megagiris came from. Yeah. And, and also, I want to talk about Godzilla's design for this. I mean, like we mm. said, he is a giant mutated iguana, and because uh, he looks nothing like the original Toho Godzilla film. He's just a giant iguana creature, which I have an iguana on my shirt, my channel icon, if you can see it right here. Yeah. <laughs> this guy got to <laughs> represent the iguanas. Yeah. Maybe my icon iguana mutate into this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, except- well he, he would have to... Um he would have to be in an egg for him to be that. So except he doesn't have sunglasses. Like he doesn't have sunglasses <laughs> at least. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and like you said, you said earlier that he has like the, this Godzilla has a giant chin. You know, mm. kind of like J- Jay Leno. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny with the the chin and the head design. So I was looking through a there's a book I bought recently. It's called The Art of Godzilla ninety eight by Patrick Totopoulos. Funny enough, he published this in Japan. Uh, and we never got this book in America, which sucks because there's so many good like information and tons of like really cool details in it. But um, when I was looking through it, one of the things he mentions is that his inspiration for Godzilla's head actually comes from sheer Khan from the jungle book. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't notice. I mean, yeah, I, I did uh, look at some images comparing this to uh, go- this Godzilla and sheer Khan from jungle book. They do almost uh, look similar and look alike. It's right? because, of, because of the chin. Well, it's it's the chin and it's the small eyes that go far back along the snout. So uh, to give some context to the audience on where the Sheer Khan, Disney's Sheer Khan, mind you, came from with the Godzilla inspiration, it's when Pat was a kid, you know, he both saw the first Godzilla film, but he also saw Disney's Jungle Book. And he put two and two together is when he was when he was a kid and thought if Godzilla had a personality like he could talk and you know interact a little bit more uh with other animals and stuff like that he thought it would be like Shere Khan cuz Shere Khan owns the jungle he's this very prideful character who literally owns his environment like he walks around like he's the king you know i mean like the the way he like grabs ka and like you know throws him around and you know and then after he (laughs) comes and when he comes after mowgli and stuff like he you know he thought like yeah that's godzilla's personality that's that's the way he sees godzilla is like shere khan so when he got yeah and when he um got around to designing Godzilla, he took some inspiration from it. It's like, why don't we add Shere Khan's head to this design? And then that's where that came from. And Roland liked it so much with the final sketches he did. They're like, well, let's use it. And 
So you ended up with a Godzilla that very much has Sheer Khan's face on it. And <laughs> that's yeah, it's it's both it's both like iguana. It's iguana, it's an iguana skull shape, but it also has Sheer Khan's head design to it because the chin the nose, and then the small eyes that go all the way far back. It's almost a shame we can't pull up any photos to do them like side by side on this. Yeah. That would yeah, that'd be I pretty know. shocking to the audience. You know, be like, <laughs> oh, like I, I see it now. Wow. That's really weird. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> and, yeah. And, and also, the, also for the spines for this Godzilla, it, that kind of almost look like shark fins. Yeah, almost. Yeah. So for the fins, I can tell you where the spines came from. They wanted Godzilla's spines to be more aerodynamic. And one of the ideas was to make them instead of protruding, you know, like in the fan shape of the, the maple leaf shape, like how they classically are. It was like, what if we make them point upward like this? So they reinforce his speed. So the spines are supposed to be more aerodynamic. So when he runs, it increases his momentum. So like all of his body weight goes straight towards the head. And then those things are, you know, they just, how do, I, how do I put it? They're like spoilers on a car, I guess. That's the best way to describe <laughs> those things. It's just they, they increase the speed when he runs. That was the idea behind it. Yeah. And, and yeah. And then, and he, and his feet almost look like a, a T Rex foot. Hmm. So the T Rex, uh, <laughs> we call the T Rex feet, they're actually ostrich feet. Did you know that? Hmm. So, so one of the things he did also was when he was doing his rough sketches, he actually went to a zoo and looked at different animals, um, trying to come up with some other extra inspiration for him. And one of the things he got from Toho was uh, he was on the phone with some executives and they told him about the first Godzilla design. And one of the things they mentioned was the first Godzilla was inspired both by dragons, but also dog features like the original, the 54 Godzilla has dog cheekbones on him. And that's also where like the, the fangs and the front kind of come from. So they're all canine features with the classic Toho Godzilla, at least with the first, the original Godzilla anyways. So he thought, why don't I go the opposite direction? And I look more at felines like cats and stuff. And then that kind of merged with sheer Khan. And that's how we got that head design. As for the the legs, though, those are ostrich feet because that's the animal he was looking at, like trying to encourage that the design moves fast. Because the one thing that Emmerich asked of him was that this Godzilla can run fast. He just said, like, out of all requirements, I want him to, like, be extremely fast. That's like, that's what I really want is this Godzilla can move extremely quick. He's not slow. So, yeah. Yeah, because in the original Godzilla films, say they, he actually walks slow, and sometimes in the Shona era, they sometimes he runs. And but in Heisei, he kind of does go slow. But but in but in this film, I mean, he does run. He actually runs like three hundred miles, thirty or three hundred miles per hour. Yeah, I think that was right. Three hundred miles per hour, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, he, all he does is just runs and hides and buildings and and for his war, that his war actually almost sounds like from the original God one of the original Godzilla films, but makes him more like a, more of a shriek version, like give him more shriek sounds. Yeah, you know, it's I, I still can't fathom the fact that they got the guy did the Hanna Barbera Godzilla sound effects to do the roar for the '98 Godzilla. <laughs> you you didn't know that, did you know that that? I did not know that. Yeah, Wait, are yeah, you talking? So. Are you like the you talk about the Hanna Barbera uh, Godzilla sound effects that they actually use for this Godzilla, but uh, but edited up a little. So, no, what I mean is they got the actor who did those noises to do the 98 Godzilla sound effects. 
So it's like it's it's not that they took those sound effects, and amplified them. No, no, like they got the actor who voiced the '98, uh, who voiced the Hanna Barbera Godzilla, to do the '98 Godzilla sound effects. Mm. Who is also Fred Fred from Scooby Doo, <laughs> which <laughs> I can't fathom the fact that they did that. <laughs> like, like what? <laughs> but it makes sense because he's a famous voice actor. He's done voices for tons of stuff. You know, Gremlins. <laughs> Ugh, it's, it's a shame I'm having a brain fart right now on the guy's name. I can't because normally I know who he is. Hang on. Yeah. Voice actor. <laughs> Frank yeah. Welker. There we go. It's yeah, Frank, Frank Welker. Welker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say uh, Frank something. Frank Walker. Y- yes. Yeah. And, uh, sometimes thing escapes me. I mean, yeah. And and that's what Nick says right here. Frank Walker. Yeah. There he goes. Yeah. Frank Walker. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he is the original Fred from Scooby Doo and voice of Gremlins and other sound effects, too. He does the voice of Abu in Aladdin. Yes. <laughs> I just, I just thought of something hilarious. <laughs> so, no, you're, you're gonna love this. You know when the missiles land at the Chrysler Building, and he like looks towards the camera, and he goes down. <laughs> Put in Fred's voice audio from Scooby Doo, where he says, "Let's split up, gang." <laughs> the missiles in the building. <laughs> That's a good one. Really Let's good. split up, gang. Yeah. <laughs> I still just. Oh man, I, I just. I think it's just so funny just realizing that guy voice Godzilla. Like that's the first thing I'm going to ask him. Like, if, if I ever meet Frank Welker, the first thing I'm going to ask him is, "So, what was it like playing as the '98 Godzilla?" Like how how was that? <laughs> like what what did they specifically ask you to do, or how did you recreate that roar? Because that that's still like I I almost still don't believe it to a full extent. Like I believe all the other noises is Frank. The roar? How did they? How did he do that? <laughs> like uh, you know, I think when yeah uh, yeah. Uh, 98 it says earlier it's a, a mixed war of the Shona Godzilla and an elephant for this film. Uh, yeah, I think they use some elephant sound effects to, to you know to this Godzilla creature. That that may be that that that's actually a huge possibility because the ro- the sound effects he makes when he gets shot on the bridge sound like a uh, elephant a little bit, so that's a possibility. You know, it's where this book doesn't talk anything about the sound design for the movie. It's just the yeah. special effects, like just making Godzilla's design, the props, and that's it. Nothing about the audio, the roar, nothing about Frank Welker, none of that. Yeah, which is a shame. And you know, um, oh, I. Didn't- you just remind me. And speaking of Frank Walker, there, there are there are some Simpsons Simpson stars in this film. Yeah, uh, yeah, like hey, hey, Hank Hank was on, uh, and uh, uh, no, that's just... good. Yeah, I'm just trying to get this a little closer here. I was trying to pull up some pages from the book here to show the audience if I can. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, because yeah, in this film they did have some Simpsons stars in this. Hank, he has Hank was and his and Harry Sierra and I. I hope I say their name right. Uh, I think you got it right. I believe so. Oh yeah, and oh. yeah, and Kurt Carly play as Godzilla. Oh. So. There we go. That's one of the here's some of the uh, sketches that got sent to Toho from the uh, Art of Godzilla '98. So these were the original sketches Patrick Atopoulos did uh, before they got the appro- the final design got approved. So they had the maquette, which you know about, which is that you know big uh, statue that Pat made. Um, let me pull that up over here. It's on. Uh, this is the other sketches. Okay, it's yeah. on this Those are his original designs. Yeah, these are the original ones he sent to Toho here. Oh, okay, that's not it. Let me go back. 
There it is. There's the maquette. Yeah, okay. this is the that's, one everybody knows. Yeah, that's the original model uh, kit and that Patrick Topless designed. Yep, and uh, it was interesting because the original design had uh, four rows of spines instead of the final three. That was one of the changes Toho made him do because they they approved the design, but they said like, well, one thing you have to get rid of the five digit fingers because Godzilla only has only Godzilla has only four digit fingers, so he had to get rid of the fifth finger on it, and then um, you have to make sure his rows of spines are in threes, not not fours because you look here he's got one two there's these double two in the middle so um the final design has just one set of spines going down in between the two big ones like mm. the classic godzilla did and uh it's actually funny he actually did a couple designs of like the heisei godzilla uh before he worked on the 98 uh design so he did some he did some like uh, sketches of different Toho Godzillas to just kind of like feel things out before he moved on to the Shere Khan looking design that we got. So this is one of his designs he did of the uh, Godzilla Desu Goji suit because um, they were actually there at the Toho studio and they got to see the Heisei Godzilla suits in person. So uh, when he came back to um, America, or uh, Greece. Uh, no, it was America, my bad. We came back to America. That's when he started doing like these little rough sketches here. Yeah. And, and also, what, you know, what Goji Fan 98 is talked about that Kurt Carly uh, played, he did play Godzilla for a suit. And let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's Kurt Carly right there, everybody. It's him in the Godzilla 98 suit prop. Yep, that's him, and yeah, I, and yeah, I didn't know they used a suit for this film, and I think, and they did use like a big animatronic uh, for for some scenes, like when Godzilla you know, picks up the truck with his mouth, and he has, and we has the car in his mouth for the Brooklyn Bridge scene at the end. Yeah, so here's some um photos of the big animatronic coming up here let me get to that so this is the inside of the top of his mouth there's his tongue there uh fun fact about his tongue it's inspired by hummingbirds yeah so he has a mm. bird tongue that's why his uh tongue shaped like that um they he he wanted to make it a little more interesting so instead of giving him like just a a flat lizard tongue they gave him like a bird tongue it's got some like little extra teeth or something in it, I guess, to help crush food. Um, and there's some better pictures of the giant animatronic fully built. Um, okay. And then this is the bottom jaw when they were finishing that up. And then this is when they were getting ready to do the, the truck scene where he picks it up in his mouth. Uh, it's, it's a shame that we didn't get to see more of this, although there is a really good shot you see of it near the end of the movie. So, fun fact: the when he comes out of Madison Square Garden, that's actually not CGI. That's actually this animatronic ripping itself out of a bunch of rubble. Wow! Yeah. So Bob Eggleton was on the set of the movie when they did that shot, and he confirmed that when he comes out of the rubble of Madison Square Garden, that's not CGI. Like that animatronic's actually there ripping itself out of a bunch of like cheap prop like you know fake rubble prop and stuff like falling off of them yeah and well thank well thank you so much for showing us uh, us nick yeah, yeah and, of course of course i got some stuff and, on the baby godzillas too if you're interested in that but we'll we'll get to that later but you go ahead yeah and so let's talk about so let's talk about earlier about the Simpsons characters. I mean, I know Nancy Cartwright is in this one, but only that's one scene. The, hmm. the same woman who did the voice of Bart Simpson. And the one scene that she uh, told the guy say, Sir, I think your story just walked by the window. And yeah. Yeah. So, you know. 
I like the Cayman guy they got from the Simpsons in there. And then of course, Hank is there is animal. Like that's, that's great. Um, Nancy, I kind of felt was eh, like, okay. Like it's, it, it's cool. It's like, Hey, it's Bart Simpson, the Godzilla movie, you know, like, mm. but I don't think it's aged. Well, like, it's just like, it's like, eh, like, it's like, okay, cool. Nancy's here. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, the, 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 what's weird is what makes that scene funny to me more is it's not the fact that Bart Simpson is like turning around like this and like, oh my God, he's outside the window. It's, it's <laughs> when you look at the monitors, you see Barney the dinosaur on and he's, it's glitching every time Godzilla makes like a footprint, like, or like he steps down in New York while walking by the building. That's what makes me laugh more. It's just like you start hearing the Barney is a dinosaur while Godzilla's <laughs> walking by the building. Like that that <laughs> always made me that always made me laugh more than the whole like uh, sir, I think your story just walked by the window, you know, because <laughs> yeah, uh, you didn't get to get the green groceries and all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and let's talk about the mayor. In this oh film. yeah, Roger E. Bird is the mayor. Yes. Yeah, and it's, it was so sad. Eh? He just passed away a few months ago, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. May, may he rest in peace. We we lost a good actor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he did he did a good job of it in this film playing the mayor. And I liked about he was like eating candy in the helicopter. His his partner's just trying to take it away. He says, "Back off, Jack." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sir, that's enough candy. And it's like, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't notice until I think I think I was Googling it back in middle school is when I finally realized, like, those two are supposed to be Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. I never put the connection together as a kid. So, uh, but yeah, when I was, when I finally learned that, I was like, oh, okay, now I see what they're kind of going here with it. Cause I thought the idea was they're just trying to make the mayor of New York incompetent. Like he was just an idiot. Like that's what they're kind of going with it. Although he does have some very good points in the movie. Like, you know, the Chrysler building and destroyed. And then it's like, you can't even put a dent in the thing when the military is trying to shoot him. <laughs> you know, trying to shoot, shoot Godzilla, even though like later on, there's kind of a retcon with that a little bit, like, but I'll get into that when we talk about the bridge scene, because yeah, wa watching it again, it kind of made me scratch my head. I was like, wait a minute, but they actually do land hits on them. But what, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, as far as the Simpsons characters go though, like I like, yeah, going back to that again, I like that we had, you know, Hank in there. He, he was good as Animal. Like, I enjoyed him. Cayman was stupid, but funny. You know, like, he was just, <laughs> yeah, he was just kind of a jerk throughout the movie. But he had some funny lines here and there sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, like, that was that was kind of it. Um, yeah, another thing about him, we'll, we'll get to that later because this comes into another part about the story that I there, there's something specific about the 98 film that I wonder when they're writing the script, it was intended to be something else like with, uh, with instead of Fran, well, I don't want to say it yet, but with America was supposed to be the one that makes Godzilla, not France in the original scripts. And I'll, I'll I have a theory as to like why they changed that why they changed that or why also that I think that was the intended idea. Cause there's something that happens right before the French guys like pull out and stuff when the broadcast happens um, with uh Cayman who gets the tape and all that stuff. And it's supposed to be like a big reveal, but you know, like it just, it kind of isn't, but I'll get to that when we, start talking about that half of the movie but we'll go back to you about the uh, characters here yeah and i also like the far when Godzilla still on kind of steps on that guy but he didn't like crush on him he's just because underneath his, his feet is just like it does and like it doesn't crush the guy at all he's just yeah, yeah he's, he's like right right in between his toes yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I can I can hear the scream in my head. The, ah! <laughs> and then he's like turns around. It's like, 
<laughs> like starts He's laughing. Like laughing yeah, crazy. Right. Yeah. I mean, that would have been my reaction too. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can't I can't deny that was like I, I can't say that was bad acting. That was very realistic, I think. I would have done the same thing and would have been laughing like crazy too. Like like <laughs> Like, I just survived that. <laughs> like, how am I still alive? But anyway. Yeah, and and also there are some references to this film as references to the original Godzilla. Like mm. that one scene where they're at the at this tropical island when they discover Godzilla's footsteps that Nick Katopoulos is, you know, doesn't know their footprints. That's almost like a references to uh, Dr. Umai's character in the original yeah, that, that was a reference to Yamani's character in the original. In fact, Nick Totopoulos kind of is the Yamani character in the movie. Um, it, it's so interesting what they did with that. So he's over in... Uh, he, he, was, he was over in Polynesia, the Polynesian Islands where the Morona bomb test goes off. Now to the audience watching this, it doesn't know what the Morona bomb is, is the Morona bomb was an illegal French hydrogen bomb test where they, it was back in the late 1960s, they dropped the hydrogen bomb off of Morona, which is a little atoll in the Polynesian Islands. And Roland Emmerich for whatever reason, I think it's because they didn't want to use the bikini atoll bomb for this. Cause it would have been a little, the movie would have been more anti, you know, military American military a little bit if had they gone that route. So they uh, chose France for it. And don't get me wrong that it, it, it works as a story element because Historically, it is an interesting topic because the Morona bomb caused a big geopolitical mess because the fact that it was never supposed to happen for one, like it wasn't approved internationally that they could do that. And uh, it, it put like a lot of pressure on France for them doing that hydrogen bomb test at the time. It was kind of like a, like, you know, like what, the heck? like, what were you thinking? You know, it wasn't, like, you know, America's hydrogen bomb tests where, you know, even though there was some very nasty consequences from them, um, it wasn't quite the same geopolitically, I believe, at least like looking at it, like all the details. That's also why the French guys in the movie are like total secrecy about um Godzilla and they're trying to co they constantly cover up what's happening in the movie because they're afraid that if word does fully get out that they're responsible for a foreign mutation attacking a major city um, that would have put more pressure on France and potentially they could be punished for it because it's their mess that just went and just devastated uh one of the biggest cities in the world in america so that's one that's one of the reasons why he's talking about like you know like you understand i'm a patriot i love my country and nick the top was like yeah and it's like it's like so you're here to clean up the nuclear test he's like my country made a mess i'm here to clean it up you know i hope you understand yeah. the, the deeper thing behind it is is he knows that his country would be put under like a, a lot of consequences if it does fully get out that they're responsible for Godzilla and by the end of the movie it's hinted like they covered it up or at least the military just kind of like dropped it I guess and the world doesn't fully quite know although there was that broadcast in New York where you see the tape on the news that oh yeah France did this <laughs> yeah like you know the, the Polynesian tests in uh the, the Polynesian islands on Morona made Godzilla. Uh, and actually now that we're into that conversation now, I might as well bring this up is that I think when they're writing the script, I'm almost positive that the initial idea was that it was supposed to be the bikini bomb that makes Godzilla because I thought about it more and I thought that the reveal of that being on the news and don't get me wrong. It does set up the scene where Nick gets fired off the project and they're all harassing him about, you know, like you brought this to the press, you know, Audrey stole the tape. 
I feel like it was supposed to be a bigger deal because it would have been the American military is the one that made Godzilla. And thematically, it makes more sense, too, when you think about it, especially with what ultimately happens to Godzilla in the end scene on the bridge. So what I mean by that is that I think had America been the ones that made Godzilla it, as, as the origin in this movie, because that's how it, it, it's at least hinted at in the first movie that the hydrogen bomb test mutated Godzilla in the original Godzilla film. Had they done that again and it was America doing it and Godzilla attacks the country that ruined his life, which is in both versions, both in the Japanese film and this one, it's, you know, like, well, it would have been that way. It would have been closer to the original movie purely because the country that ruins his life is also the one that kills him. And it would have, it would have put more thematic sense, I think a little bit, had they done that to, to a specific degree. Cause although they used the oxygen destroyer to kill him in the first movie, which, you know, classic, yeah. cla I mean, classic movie. Great. It would have been, it would have been interesting to see, how they would have done that like with with the uh if if america was the one that made him and then also kills him at the end i i feel like just it would have came full circle because godzilla attacks the country that ruined his life and he's killed by them because in the japanese films he gets drawn into a destiny he never asked for because of the arrogance of the american military that's that's what sets everything off in the Japanese films is because he got, he got caught in the castle Bravo blast and, you know, he never ends up attacking America if, unless you count destroy all monsters and that, but uh, the later shell movie, but yeah, like in the first regarding the first Godzilla though, he attacks the wrong country. He never attacks the, the actual country that ruined his life. In this one, it would have made perfect sense. And then America butchering him at the end of the movie. And then I, I wish if they did that and then they had maybe a longer pause with, you know, Nick and the military kind of like looking at like just the dead Godzilla on the bridge, realizing like, oh, my God, like, what have we done? You know, we just we we made something that never asked to be born and we also just killed it, you know, like, I feel like that would have, that would have been like, just a lot more respectful to the first Godzilla had they done that. And then it also would have been more respectful because it would have been questioning the use of the post war powers that America had with the hydrogen bomb and whether or not the tests were worth it or not, you know, because that's, that's the thing we still talk. We, we don't talk about enough is the fact the American military pulled off 25 tests, like 25 hydrogen bomb tests. I mean, did, did we even need to do that many? I, I don't think yeah. so. Personally, me, I don't think so. Yeah. We had, we had castle Bravo, Kwajalein, and then we blew up a bunch in the atmosphere. And what was the point of that? Like, like to yeah. me, it, 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 like it, to me, historically, it just comes off like we're just showing off. Like, that's what it came off to me as it was like, we're showing off. We got a weapon. Let's see what it can do, you know? And I, I just, you know, I'm sorry if I'm rambling here, everybody, like kind of jumping around ideas. I'm just oh, that's to okay. Grab my, grab my thoughts you, here. Just, I, I yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I kind of like agree with that. I mean, I mean, there have been so many nuclear bomb tests, uh, like uh, what you talked about first, the Polynesians and, and then the other nuclear tests from the originals. And, but there have been like, I know in many, in many, in the previous Godzilla films, they're like, they're like, God, there are three creatures who are, they're like three creatures who are exposed to the radioactivity that they actually, they actually made these creatures into Godzilla. Like, like the original 1954 Godzilla was created by a, like a, a different creature, like from the prehistoric time because, uh, but it was tested by a nuclear bomb in war, during World War II. But well, I had to after more. World War II, but yes, go oh, ahead. it's after World War II. I, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I mean. I mean, and then 
for the Heisei Godzilla that he was that what we that was but in Godzilla versus King Ghidorah they they that we learned that Godzilla the Heisei Godzilla was a it's just a, a dinosaur creature that mm. but they thought he was composed to the H bomb test after World War II. They thought it was the original Godzilla, but it's not. It's a separate creature. But they, but they transport the dinosaur into the Barren Sea. But there's actually nuclear waste in the by a Russian submarine that crashes into that, and then the dead dinosaur is just exposed to the nuclear waste and becomes becomes the Heisei Godzilla. But then in this film, they it it was. It was the French government who, who who did the nuclear test, and they actually had a mutant guan had iguana mutate into another Godzilla. Hmm. Like yeah. that's what you've been trying to say, right? Oh well, yes, like that that too. Um, that 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 was basically what I was like trying to say is that you know, um, I think I think had they kept America more as part of their response There's more as the reason Godzilla exists in the 98 film. It would have been metaphorically closer to the Japanese version. And then also thematically wise with its story, just a little bit, you know, cause uh, you know, like it, it felt, it felt like more what they were going to do with that broadcast scene was that it would have had a former branch of the military, like the CIA trying to cover up that the department of defense made Godzilla on accident from the hydrogen test, which would have made a better story too. Like, like it's America own branch of America is trying to cover up that they did this, you know? And then also just, it would be the first time in a long time that there's, you know, in a story, there's some sort of accountability being done about the hydrogen bomb test using Godzilla. Like, I mean, again, like just that would have been such a better story than what we got. Like, like just when I think about it, you know, that, that that's what I was kind of going with there. Um, going to your thing about the mutate creature, the first Godzilla came from. So uh, Tamayuki Tanaka, when he wrote the original story for the first Godzilla, is that the first Godzilla had his own colony, like his own kind below the atoll of bikini. And um, they were sleeping or just living beneath a cavern down there. And when the hydrogen bomb Castle Bravo test goes off in the lagoon, it kills his entire family, leaving only him. Like only one got one of his kind survived. And then, that's the one that becomes the 54 Godzilla and, you know, wreaks his vengeance on Japan. And in fact, the hydrogen bomb is what made his skin look the way it does. There's, there's a book he published uh, sometime in the nineties when King Ghidorah or Godzilla versus King Ghidorah was coming out. And it's got these really nice illustrations that show the whole thing. It shows that like, you know, him kind of chilling beneath the waves. There's other, members of his kind and he's just kind of like laying there on a rock you know sleeping and then the bomb goes off and you see all these like sparks and stuff start shooting underwater and he sees like his entire like family just be killed right in front of him and he's like kind of covering his face like this from the bright lights and then he goes in attacks Odo Island and then he starts sinking all the trade ships that come out from Odo Island. And then that's how he gets to Japan. It's the bright lights from Tokyo Bay that actually drew him to uh, onto land because the bright lights reminded him of the hydrogen bomb he got caught in. Uh, it, the reason I'm bringing that up though, is because there were storyboards they did for the 98 movie when they show the opening and after the test was after the Morona bomb was going off and does its whole thing, there would have been another sequence where we saw a bunch of dead lizard carcasses from the radiation around the nest. And then it focuses on the egg as it cracks open. So you, so the, the reason I, I bring this up is because they were going to do the same thing with the 98 film is they were going to put this idea that Godzilla lost his entire family to this hydrogen bomb test, leaving him as the only survivor of his kind, but also the first of his kind. Cause you know, 
there's there's nothing else like him on the planet <laughs> so mm -hmm. they're pushing this this idea that he's the last of his kind from that colony because he's the, the only member of that family that survived but he's also the first because of his powers and what he got mutated what what the mutation did to him so and you know that's something it's a shame that we didn't get that in the final uh, movie, you know, like the all the dead radioactive skeletal looking lizards. Like in the storyboards, you can pull them up. There, it shows like a bunch of these like lizard bones and radioactive dust fall out, and then you see the lizard nest, and it shows the egg close up, like from the movie. Except when it rips open, there's like some like burning like lava or something coming from the inside. I guess implying the radiation like when he hatched out of the egg the radiation actually started seeping out of the egg like it's it, it got so infested into the embryo i guess some of it starts to like leak out when he comes out of the egg you don't see him but you just see like the egg kind of cracked open halfway and you see like these burning marks where the cracks are on it uh yeah but in the final film of course we just get the radioactive snow no lizard carcasses and the uh you know, the close up of the egg and the lightning bolt, which is supposed to be implying the egg hatches just moments after the bomb goes off. Yeah. And, and also, uh, GoziFan98 says this this movie of Godzilla 1998 gives a loving memory of Tunuki Tanaka as after, as after Tanaka passed away in 1997. Yeah, it did. At the end of the movie, it said "In loving memory of Tamiyuki Tanaka, um, you know, the the creator of Godzilla, although like it's kind of shared between him and Irsho Honda. But Tamiyuki Tanaka, I, I consider the real creator of Godzilla because he's the one that looked over the ocean and thought like, what if a giant monster attacked J Japan, you know, after uh, he was going back on his plane flight. But yeah, Tamiki Tanaka, um, just to talk about him real quick, uh, he was a fantastic guy, like a really great man. Um, oh, yeah, he sure is. He he showed up, to, in fact, actually when he was, like, dying of old age, he came onto the set of Rebirth of Mothra while they were filming it just to, like, oversee everything. And it's believed that because of his old age at the time. Cause you know, he knew he was going to be leaving soon. That's where part of the idea for Godzilla versus Destroya and rebirth of Mothra came from. Cause both have to do with Godzilla die, Godzilla Mothra dying and then their children replacing them, carrying the torch. And it's believed cause he was getting ready to pass away is where that idea was starting to come into play from. Although for Destroy, a majority of it came from Satsuma going to Kawakita during the filming of Space Godzilla and saying, hey, shouldn't we end this? <laughs> like, it was actually Kawakita, it was actually Satsuma <laughs> who went to Kawakita and said, like, you know, if I'm going to do another movie, it's got to be like the last one. Like, he's kind of the guy who went like, yeah, like, we have to end this, like, after Space Godzilla. So, and that's where Destroy came from. Yeah, and... And also, I want to talk about the how how Roland Emmerich and the Devlin uh, came up with the idea for this film. I mean, I mean, they after they do Independence Day, they they kind of want to make their own uh, another disaster movie, but they want before they come up with their own Godzilla version. I mean, they they want to make a movie that combined with Independence Day and Jurassic Park. That's kind of like makes those movies between. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of it in there. I mean, I'm not going to deny the David Arnold score sounds very Jurassic Park esque. Although, you know, um, something funny about that is when, um, what you know, the Jurassic Park kind of sounding music starts playing when he comes out of the sewer for the first time. Yeah, the original idea was that was supposed to be a lot more dramatic. Um, there's a scene that there's a video that they have uh, from Kaju Masterclass where they interviewed uh, David Arnold and they asked him, you know, was the music always supposed to sound like that when he comes out for the first time? And he said, no, 
Raw initially he said I wanted it to be a lot more dramatic because it was supposed to be a very tense scene when he comes out. And Emmerich said, I want the scene to be awesome. Like you, like the audience is not afraid that Godzilla just came out that we want the audience to be in awe when they see him. And that's where the Jurassic Park sounding music for the da, 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 started, it came from, it was from that, you know, yeah. they, they wanted, they wanted the audience to be in awe at Godzilla when they see him not to be scared of him, even though that was supposed to be what happens. It's supposed to be a more tense scene when he comes out like that. Yeah. And, and I, and I did like the music too, the music score of it. And speaking of music, they actually did make a second soundtrack, the artist soundtrack, uh, uh, that the songs that, uh, the the one with Puff Daddy and Come with Me and Come with Me <laughs> and Heroes by Wallflower. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, I, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Go ahead. And I gotta say, I kind of like the uh, the song Hero by Wallflower. I like that song better than the Come with Me song. Oh yeah, yeah. Heroes was like a a banger of a song. Like you know, like it was you know it was a remake of David Bowie's song. But I think the Wallflowers did a fantastic job. The music video is great too. <laughs> Although, Come with Me made me ask so many questions because like it, it's weird when you listen to the lyrics, you're like, what does this have to do with Godzilla? And then yeah. when you watch, well, here's the weird thing: if you watch the music video, then it makes sense then the song makes perfect sense. Like why it's kind of there. It's the song exists because of the music video, basically. So what happens in the music video is for those who haven't seen it, Puff Daddy wakes up. He sees Godzilla's attack in New York. He starts singing about a broken relationship and how much he hates being in this kind of rough relationship. And then uh, it ends with him in, square garden and he's insulting godzilla and the whole song is about puff daddy basically hating godzilla <laughs> that's what the song is about it's I, about it's about puff daddy and godzilla in an abusive relationship and yeah he, and he's like close your ass come with me <laughs> like, like if you ever watch it like he's like threatening godzilla <laughs> while he's in front of him in times square yeah, like at Times Square. He's like, he's like, I want to fight you. <laughs> I want to bite you. <laughs> you know, like, uh, he's like, I can't stand it, but lock you. <laughs> and yeah. And Godzilla's like, just like staring at him. It's, it's weird, but it makes sense. Like, it's like Puff Daddy's like challenging Godzilla. That's what the song is about. It's about Puff Daddy it, and Godzilla being in an abusive relationship. I it guess. does make sense. And, I gotta watch that music video. The only music video yeah. I ever watched is the Hero music video, mm. and I love that song so much, and yeah. I couldn't stop listening. I and and also let's talk about the marketing campaign. What's yeah. I brought my dinner? You know, Taco Bell. Oh yes, yeah. This is where I need to bring out the the, the press kit for this. Uh, before we jump to that, though, I did want to talk about one more song on that uh, Godzilla the album that you mentioned. So there is one song on there that actually does have to do with Godzilla. Surprisingly, <laughs> in fact, I would almost say it predates um, "Who Will Know Tragedy" by a few years, a little bit, because the song is actually from Godzilla's perspective. Did you know that? Hmm. You know what? You know, know what song that. it is. Uh. I don't know. Deeper underground. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think like I'm going with the... deeper underground, you know, by Jammer Kwai. Yeah, that song is written from Godzilla's perspective when he's in New York. <laughs> yeah, like that's uh, if you pull up the lyrics. Yeah. Like, hang on. Like, I, I do want to just like pull a specific line up that gives it away real quick. Deeper underground. It's in the second verse of it because we talked about this on a podcast. So here's like the first line. Something's come to rock me and I can't keep my head. I get nervous in the New York City streets from my legacy treads. I know I'm better off standing in the shadows far from humans with guns. But now it's too late. There's no escape from what they have done. And then bottom, bottom 
text below that one. Some people with a pocket full of money and an eye full of hate take pleasure in destruction of the very thing that they try to create. Somebody, somebody tell me why does all mankind only tamper and touch, have a habit where they bite off more than they can chew, and now it's too much. Like, that's all from Godzilla's perspective, which fits with, you know, the first Godzilla a little bit, I think. You know, because it's it's doing the arrogance of man thing. The idea of mankind ruined Godzilla's life and made <laughs> essentially made what he is. And then, you know, mankind has to deal with the consequences of that. And then Godzilla is kind of asking, why me? You know, like, like why, why does this have to happen? <laughs> so, yeah, and that's really cool. But I also want to talk about it. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I also want to talk about back more about the Taco Bell. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get to the Taco Bell stuff now that we're yeah. on the topic of it. Because I'm really, uh, I haven't eaten mine yet. I mean, yes, yeah, so <laughs> you got your taco. cup. I only, oh, yeah. I only got a, an original Taco Bell cup. And... Yeah, I was going to say, like, you haven't eaten your tacos yet, dude? Like, this is getting cold. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, but. But I already ate mine, and, it's, oh. and it was really my first time trying Taco Bell. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, never mind. Okay, you did have your taco. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Did, did you like Taco Bell? I actually tried it, and I like it. And I actually had the an an, an original order. It's just crunchy taco. It was delicious. Yeah, yeah the crunchy taco is the classic. Yeah, and what I heard they right right after the teaser trailer came out, the the one that has Godzilla's foot stamp, stomping on a T Rex skeleton in a museum, they couldn't give out more details of the monster yet. But when the marketing campaign picked up for Taco Bell, they actually re- reversed Godzilla's uh, looks and design for this film. Yeah, they had to hide, like, almost all of it. The only thing they could show was either the foot, the tail, and maybe some stuff with the spines, but near the tail. So, like, if you look at all the Taco Bell commercials for Godzilla, you'll see one, like, where the the, ta- the Taco Bell Chihuahua is, like, sitting on his tail, and he's like, hey, Godzilla, what you want to order? Or the, <laughs> the one where, like, the foot comes crashing down, and he's got the box. He's like, here, lizard, lizard. Like, well, mm. I need a bigger box, you know. <laughs> what comes down? That's kind and, of like a that's kind of like a references from Jaws. We're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah, yeah, we're going to need a bigger box. <laughs> yeah. And then they uh, they did that whole thing where, like, the reason they did that commercial with the the Taco Bell dog trying to catch him in a box is because they did this little ad campaign where it was called the uh, Fine Godzilla and Win Sweepstakes. So they did this. Um, this thing here where uh, here I can show you. So it's like you would get these tabs on these Taco Bell cups here. And if, you know, if you found Godzilla on the cup, then you would win a prize of some sort, like either money or a trip to somewhere, or maybe it was like free tickets, you know, something along the lines of that. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I say you're so lucky that you got one of those merchandise cups. I I only got an original. Well, I gotta thank my friend uh, Chris for giving me one of these cups here because he's a great friend. Um, I actually had six of these at one point, and then mm. my dad ruined all of them. <laughs> That's how I <laughs> lost all those. So because yeah. they somebody at G Fest was selling them for like a dollar. Like they he had like a whole cardboard box of these things, and I picked up like six of them. It was back in G Fest 2014. I think because my dad likes to drink out of these big cups like this, he just kind of saw them and was like, "Oh, maybe I could drink out of those." And then over time, from the rain and all that, they got ruins. Like the, the <laughs> art, you wouldn't even know they were Godzilla cups anymore. They were just total. <laughs> so I was kind of bummed out about that because for a while I didn't yeah. have a uh, Godzilla cup to put in here, but now it's, it's all good and fixed. Yeah. Um, but- but who knows? Maybe I'll go go. Maybe I'll go for a search hunt for them at, at G Fest. So, yeah, if, I would if, definitely go look for them. And if you can't find them on there, they'd be on eBay. Yeah, maybe. And and also, I would also like to talk about the one scene uh, that that when Godzilla is like uh, approaching in front of the. 
the military base where they set up another trap for him to eat the fish. But Godzilla, he he is now getting smart. He he knows that it is a trap. So the military knows that he's in smart. And he started, they decide to fire at him and 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 he just runs away. And then he just goes right into the the uh, the the river and it's where is the as I I forgot what that river is called in in New York as James River I believe. yeah I think so I mean when he was like swimming in there like a normal iguana or a sea dragon yeah. does yeah like a iguana does um, river I believe it is the James River yeah I mean yeah I didn't. And then when the the two summer no, it's the Hudson. My bad. The, Why the did I say Hudson. James River? I sound like an yeah. It's Hudson's River. Yeah, the Hudson River. Yeah, and and what if when they're after they uh, they fire the missiles at another submarine and they miss him, when they fire two more fire missiles at him, he was when Godzilla is heading right back to a shore, but he was gonna. But he wasn't. He's just going to bury it on the ground. And then finally they fired at Godzilla. And and they thought they really got him for good. They thought they finally killed him. But thought he was like dead. And then they thought. And when the audience and the theater are watching that part. They thought the movie's over already. But <laughs> no it's not. Yeah, it was um, the torpedoes knocked him out from the uh, pressure from the explosion, just like conked him out. It didn't didn't kill him, but it like, you know, just conked him out from the impact. If I remember right, the torpedoes hit the side of the wall he's digging in. They don't make a direct impact on him, but they they do like um, hit the wall he's digging into and that knocks him out for a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah, another thing too. The '98 Godzilla has gills on him too, on the sides of his neck. Um, so oh, he, yeah, he can, that, yeah, he he can breathe underwater like the Toho Godzilla. <clears throat> yeah, kind of like if you, if you look, I did not notice that. If it, it's so hard to see, like uh, if I had to look back to that film and look closely at the neck, um, and and also, uh, let's talk about the uh, the. Baby Raptor Godzillas. Oh, it's baby Godzillas. So before we uh, move on to that one real quick, since we were talking about the Hudson River and the when the military tries to trap them, since we finally got to that part now, uh, one of the things I was going to mention about that is that during that scene when he's running into the Hudson, they actually do land a couple shots on him, but it doesn't do anything. So the artillery trucks... In the first shot, when you see him running and he's heading towards the Hudson, they fire two missiles that go over his spines, but then all the tanks and other extra ground forces that they have that's blocking the Hudson River, when he's marching forward, like he's running you know, towards the camera before yeah. he jumps, they land hits on him. Like you see the impact happen, but it doesn't do anything. So. Yeah. And that, that begs the question. It's like, wait a minute. So they do land hits on him, but it doesn't hurt him. But the missiles with the jets, the missiles on the jets kill him though. You know, like that makes you kind of scratch your head for a minute. It's like, wait a minute. Like what, what, why? Like what, what, why, why did you have it? So the tanks and everything on the ground doesn't hurt him, but the jets yeah. kill him. And I figured out I figured out why there there's might be a reason why that is at least uh, this is my theory about it because there is something that interestingly matches up the, and this is what I was talking about with the first Godzilla movie too so when they were writing the script or like while they were writing it it was said Roland Emmerich watched the first Godzilla movie and he couldn't get into the rest of the show movies, but he did watch the first one all the way through. If you go back and watch it where Godzilla heads into Tokyo Bay, the, the jets that come out after him, they never land a single hit on him. So in the yeah, entirety, I... in the entirety of the first Godzilla movie and in King of the Monsters, the jets never land a single hit on him. Like the first Godzilla never gets hit by the jet, jet missiles. They miss every single time. When yeah, I didn't notice it. Yeah, so 
I had a theory that he got the idea for the Jets to kill him because you never see what the Jets do to the first Godzilla. Because keep in mind, he said that he was only looking at the first movie. He didn't look at any of the other ones. So that would make perfect sense because he's going off the logic of the first Godzilla film, not the other ones, not anything else that we know. Like the fact Jets don't hurt him. He's indestructible to all this other stuff. I, I genuinely think that's where that came from, partially, aside from just wanting America or just, you know, just wanting the military to take him down. I just assume that's his reasoning for why he said, oh, OK, that's acceptable, like in his point of view, because he watched the first movie. and He's like, well, the oxygen destroyer kills him, but I never saw what those things would have done to him. Maybe they actually would have hurt him. But, you know, I know I didn't see that. So. Again, going off the first movie. To us, who knows? Maybe the missiles actually would have hurt the first Godzilla. Yeah. For all we know. Because, again, we never see them hit him. So, I mean, I don't think so because of all the stuff that we know now about the first Godzilla. I don't think they would have hit him. I mean, I don't think they would have hurt him. But then again, I mean, we never see them land a hit. The tanks and artillery on the ground land hits and it doesn't do anything. So I always assumed that the 98 Godzilla was going by that logic a little bit, that all the artillery and stuff on the ground hits him. It does nothing. And then Emmerich said, why don't we use the jets to kill him? Because I never saw those things land a hit on the first Godzilla. So I yeah. want them to kill him in this movie. And that's, yeah. that, that, that's what, that was my theory about it. And it, and it makes sense, you know, in fact, yeah. actually, I think it's the same number of jets that come after him, too, right? So it's two jets that come after the first Godzilla, and then they don't land any hits. And then in this movie, it was two fighter jets, I believe. It was two yeah, fighter jets I that come so. after him. Yeah. yeah. In fact, that, that the army tanks, they, they couldn't kill Godzilla, but the jets did. Yeah, but in the previous, uh, in the original Godzilla films, the Jets never did kill, kill Godzilla. It, but in this film, it was the Jets that finished them off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, like, but yeah, I did want to just like get that out there before we uh, move on to the next part. But you go ahead now, since we got that that topic yeah. taken care of. Yeah, and yeah. I, and also the baby Godzillas, they just blew my mind. They're, it's like Roland Emlick and D. Devlin, they want to do their own version of Velociraptors from Jurassic Park. You know, here's my one problem with those things. It will we're just with the Jurassic Park. And I, I see it. I do see the Velociraptor thing. But... They are nothing more than smaller versions of the adult one. And what happens if you shrink him down to human size? He's like a die. He's like a velociraptor. Yeah. So that's that. That's the problem I see with it is that like, you know, looking at it, like the way they use them was kind of like the dinosaurs, Jurassic park. I do see that. Right. But at the same, but at the same time, it's like, it's a smaller version of the adult and it acts like a smaller version of the adult. Really? Like it's let, let's see, it runs ridiculously fast. It's go, I will say this going after the people who smell like fish is a little goofy, but all right, but maybe they're hungry. I mean, hmm. I, I mean, all right, like let's just, Put the idea that, you know, the, the hatchlings are starving and maybe they don't really care about the fact that they smell like the fish. And they just want to yeah. eat them. Yeah, they because they're really born. So, yeah, because they I mean, first, after they hatch, they seem harmless at first. But but then the, the, they start become like raptor vicious and because they because the the French you know, army men and, and including Nicotopolis, they they have they they add, they have fish scented smell on them because they smell like the fish. Because, and the baby, uh, and the baby Godzilla smell of them, and then and they vision their mind is like they vision they it look like a giant fish. 
I always like, thought I always thought it was just they were starving so bad after they started eating all the fish they just didn't care anymore and it was just like you know animal instinct kicking in like I gotta eat something they smell like fish I'm gonna eat them <laughs> you know <laughs> it was just kind of like their instincts taking in you know and like I, I figure that would have probably what was gonna happen had they escaped is they probably would have tried eating a few other people had they got out in the, outside the building and then pop, pop likely hopped into the Hudson River to go and eat all the fish out of there and then slowly get bigger into giant Godzillas and then take yeah. over the entire world. In fact, you know, actually know how many baby Godzillas there were? I kind of lost count on that. So I've heard the number is it was 500 baby Godzillas, I believe. I gotta say, holy cow. Honestly, a lot of eggs. Not that many, but that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I also love the part when they finally escape out of the building and had the baby Godzilla's trap and then they fired the jet missiles on the building. It Lee's has good hits. And, <laughs> and then after that, Godzilla just emerged uh, out of the ground and and he started looking at the uh, the heroes and then they stared down at his at at his newborn babies and they so he was so sad that they they just died but they they just hatched and now they just died and then and then he looks up and he kind of blames those guys because they he thought that they did it and he's like very angry and i mean he's kind of right though they are the ones that told him to launch the missiles i mean so he you're right actually i mean he 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 did blame him because well he he's not rationally aware that they called the military to blow up Madison Square Garden, but you know like he's not wrong. I mean, even though it was like just an educated guess because he saw them and saw the dead babies, but yeah, he 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 was going after the right people, <laughs> as as Matthew <laughs> Roderick said. He looks very angry. <laughs> yeah, and it's so weird. I mean, the baby Godzillas they they do like. Attack and eat the the army the French army men in raptor style, but but Godzilla the big guy himself it, that he doesn't eat people. I mean, when he's this one scene, he was staring down at Nicotopolis. I mean, he just stares at him. I mean, he doesn't eat him at all. He's just forcing him, and he just walks away. Mm. I mean, like. They say in this film that Godzilla is, is not a monster at all. He's just an animal. So, yes and no. One of the things they were trying to do was make the audience empathize more with Godzilla. And they thought the best way to do that was to make it a moral gray. So, to put it into, like, again, he's... A living thing that is lost in a world he doesn't belong in and that's that's pretty close to some of the internal conflict with the, the toho godzilla films a little bit because one of the the topic that's always brought up in all the movies with the human characters is whether or not godzilla has a place in our world or should he be killed like that's always the conversation that happens in all the movies so I, I see what they were going with. It's just, you know, I think in execution, you know, it, it was like going back to what I said earlier, had some better decisions been made with some elements of the story and then ultimately how he dies, that would have made it more effective trying to sell to the audience that, you know, you're supposed to feel a lot of empathy for him more than what we got, which is, you know, he does come off just like an animal, but I know what they were trying to do was they're trying to make him both a monster, but he's also an animal that doesn't belong here. Or more importantly, he's, he's a victim of fate that lost in a world he doesn't belong in going back to the first Godzilla movie in a way, you know, cause that's, that's something else too. In Japan, 
there's not a lot of conversation about Godzilla being a force of nature. You know, that's actually something we talk about more. Yeah. So if you if you pull up some forums they have in Japan where like Godzilla fans in Japan talked about Godzilla, what's interesting is they always bring up that we talk about Godzilla being a force of nature and, you know, a representation of nature's wrath and stuff. But in, in Japan, Godzilla is the invisible fear. He's the, what the, they call man. It's it's the hydrogen bomb thing again, but it's, it's a little deeper than that. Like Tamiyuki Tanaka described Godzilla as he's the nightmare that stirs in the darkness of the human soul, the sacred beast of the apocalypse. That's one of his quotes about him. And the Japan Godzilla fans refer him to the invisible fear and mankind's capacity to kill itself through war and environmental destruction. Like that's 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 the way they see Godzilla. They see Godzilla as actually something unnatural that came out of mankind's arrogance, not a nature striking back thing like we do. We always call Godzilla like being a thunderstorm or a tornado. But the problem with that is that a thunderstorm doesn't leave radiation poisoning and isn't <laughs> something that something to the extent of Godzilla, which is ex surely exists because of hydrogen, because of the hydrogen bomb and nuclear energy, you know, that that's, that's the only problem with that is that while some of it is natural, the existence of why he's there isn't. So they talk about, and they think like, you know, shouldn't we be saying Mothra is the force of nature? Cause that's the way they see it. They see Mothra as a thunderstorm and these kind of things like she represents nature godzilla is something completely else he's 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 a polarization of it he's nature deformed is what he is so and and that makes sense with the conflict again that we're talking about that you know godzilla is this thing that has no place for him but it, it's questioned whether or not he needs to die so the world can go on or if he has a place in it. And how the movies go is that he does eventually have one, but there it comes at a consequence or a price to it. So, like, if you go by the Heisei movies, it's that, you know, Godzilla is ultimately killed by the nuclear energy in his core from burning Godzilla. And then junior who's become more accustomed to mankind becomes the Godzilla that can live alongside, you know, alongside mankind in a healthy relationship, potentially, if that's the ending that we would, if that's the way that series ends after junior wakes up. So yep. anyway, sorry if that and, was going on a little long. Yeah, I was going to say like, so, we and we only have a few minutes left to uh, left on this, and mm -hmm. I want to start like uh, I want to I want to talk about uh, the name for Godzilla. I mean, I mean this Godzilla creature in this film. I mean the name of of it, like Godzilla, it doesn't fit properly. I mean, I know mm -hmm. it, it is Godzilla, but but. Some people say that this Godzilla is not really the Godzilla we know from the original Toho films, but then, and then later in years, and when 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 the rights for the TriStar Godzilla was almost expired, and that that Toho decided they would took uh, this Godzilla creature in Godzilla Final Wars, and they took out the god name, and they just renamed this monster Zilla. So that that came from the Final Wars director who wanted to put in the 98 Godzilla and get him get killed by uh, the Toe Godzilla. But yeah. they he honestly wanted to do it as a joke and just made the trademark as a joke thing with the name. So it's it was it started off with people saying God the design or that version of the character takes the God out of Godzilla's name. And then he thought it was a funny joke, made a trademark thing and said, well, we can't technically use the 98 Godzilla, but what we're going to do is we're going to scan a trend masters figure of it. Yeah. That like, like he said, they're separate characters. Yes. So 
we're going to use this inspired by the 98 Godzilla, even though it looks exactly like it, almost. Yeah. And but we're going to call it Zilla instead, just to show the audience, like, hey, we're going to have him get killed by the Toe Godzilla. Yeah. And and I want to say that the, the, when they took uh, this Godzilla and Godzilla Final Wars and they renamed it Zilla, they actually kind of redesigned him to make a more or less CGI looking and less design looking like. Oh yeah. Like the fact he stands upright and he doesn't yeah, even he... Like, have the same posture as the other one. And, and what part of the reason for that is because they took that trend masters figure of the ultimate Godzilla and they scanned it up and turned that into a 3d model. So they didn't even build the 3d model from scratch. They scanned a trend masters figure up and said, okay, we're done. Like yeah. that's basically what happened. Yeah. So, so the Godzilla in 1998 wanted, he actually just crushed down. And he's just like a normal, like dinosaur in it. But in Godzilla Final Wars, he, Godzilla actually just kind of almost stands up straight a little. Yeah. He's like, he, he stands upright, like, you know, the toe Godzilla a little bit, but he's hunched forward a little more. But essentially, he, he stands upright though he's 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 mm. up like this and his head's going forward like that so in compared to the 98 godzilla where he he walks like a god he walks like a dinosaur yeah and and also since we have almost uh, available we since we have almost time left i mean before we wrap this up i want to talk about the anime series uh-huh yeah i mean I, I only watched a few episodes of this. I mean, I didn't watch uh, like a whole bunch of them. I only watched like maybe five or six of them, I think. I don't remember. It's, it's been so long since I watched the anime series. But the it this series came out right after the film. And and if I heard the first episode of it, it's actually, you know, it took place like, they actually redo the scene of the ending of the film and they kill off of Godzilla and then the the new hashling re, re, is is hashling re, reborn and then and then and then later that Nick Gatopoulos just raised this you know, baby Godzilla as his own i mean so Nick Gatopoulos is the new Godzilla's uh, adopted father yeah, yeah, it was, um, they took that from the script for the uh, Godzilla 98 sequel, because that was the opening of how that was going to go, is that they would have searched to see if any more eggs remained, and then the baby Godzilla hatches out, sees Nick, thinks it's his parents, he gets scared off, and then that would have led to Philip finding Nick at his wedding, telling him we got to go to Australia, Godzilla's back. And yeah, but instead we got what happens here where the adult Godzilla finds Nick in New York and stuff. And yeah, it's um, the animated series was good. I mean, if you haven't watched it all the way through yet, I highly recommend it. It's funny. They sneaked in a couple Toho monsters into the series like wow. Hedora. Yeah. Hedora, Gabara. Um, <laughs> trying to think who else. Some. Another name just snapped. It, it, I had it and I just lost it. There was another one in there, but um, I'll l let it come back to me. I guess yeah. Adora Gabara. Well, okay. Yeah. So yeah. if you ever pull up the Crackler, that's supposed to be Gabara because he's a mo he's a monster. It's born from a dream of a guy yeah, in, in a coma. And Hedora is the uh, nano beast. It's a robotic microorganism that feeds on pollution and grows bigger as it feeds on pollution and changes yeah. its form. Yeah. And, and I gotta say, I mean, some fans say that they joined the animation series more than the film because it has more monsters to have Godzilla fight with. Yeah. And I, I can't blame him. I mean, you know, like it's, you do finally get to see him fight other monsters and it's, it's, it's fun. Like I, it is a lot of fun getting to see him beat the crap out of all these different mutated monsters he fights although i will say this though is that sometimes it makes me question in this universe like how many bomb tests did we have because there's a mutated shrew there's a mutant vampire bat that's like 
bigger than Godzilla. And it makes me wonder, I'm like, we never dropped a hydrogen bomb in South America. Where'd that thing come from? (laughs) Like, Uh, it's kind of like, I kind of like, I I like to think about it sometimes, you know, even though it's not necessary because the show never brings it up, but I like to think about, I'm like, wait a minute, vampire bat, giant beetle. These things don't live in bikini or Polynesia. Where'd they come from? (laughs) You know? Uh, well, I think we're just about almost time. So, and I got to say, Nick, or, that thank you so much for joining me in this episode. And oh, I got to say cool, that, buddy. I got to say this episode is almost a, almost a two hour uh, live stream. It, it's even longer than my Godzilla versus King Ghidorah episode. Yeah. And like, shame though. I, didn't get enough time to show everybody. Well, do we got a few minutes left? Because I do want to show them some of this real quick before we go. Uh, I possible. think. Well, I think we're just about to wrap wrap it up. Uh, we're about then. to wrap up. Oh, okay. Should yeah, be, yeah but, I kind of get ahead of myself a little. Woo! Bit. Forgot forgot about all this other stuff I brought yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, I sorry say, about I, that, everybody. My apologies. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Nick. You you did give us some information that you that you know so much about the behind the scenes and everything. And I want yeah. to thank you for all that. I mean, I learned so much about. Ooh, I need coffee. <laughs> oh. oh, you call this coffee? <laughs> hey, you stole my line. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know if you were gonna say it or not. All yeah. right, okay. Actually, redo that, and I'll and I'll do <laughs> like this is America. <laughs> yeah, like. Oh, you call this coffee? I call this America. <laughs> More cream. <laughs> that was actually really good. That was a really good impression. Where he did like the book cream. <laughs> I love that guy. I like his character. And oh yeah, like uh, yeah, like Philip. Philip is like the best character of the movie. Like ne- <laughs> you know, next to Matthew Broderick and his dumb lines he's got here and there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't see it, Colonel. That was a footprint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and so yeah, and yeah, and like I said. And and I want to thank you again for joining me in this episode, Nick. And maybe someday in the future, you will have me as a guest on your channel someday. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I'd love to have you on sometime. Yeah, maybe talk about G-Fest or uh, anything you want to talk about to have me as a guest on your show. Well, if you're coming to G-Fest, we can do it live there. Yeah, good idea. I mean, and... And I'm really looking forward to see you at G Fest uh, this year. Actually, next month. Yeah, after next I, month. Yep, after I get back from my trip from Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. Yeah, man, I need to need to hop hop into gear, get all this other stuff done. Because oh man, like the fact it's already June 9th it's making me worried. <laughs> yeah, and well, the just just about wrap things up. And thank you everybody for watching this. So until next time, we're about to enter the millennium era of Godzilla film. The next episode will be Godzilla 2000 Millennium from 1999. And thank you all for watching. And like I said in Japanese, Saranawa, yep. or the, the, like that we did the American film of Godzilla. And like I said in English, uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for having me on, my friend. <laughs>